Thank you. So we're resuming the Comox Valley Regional District Board Meeting of Tuesday, May 23rd, 2023. And I'll acknowledge again that we're on the unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation, the original keepers of this land. And as part of our commitment to reconciliation, we educate ourselves in the public on the contents of the calls to action from Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And uh, we have a continuation of the um, call to action on health, action 24. We call upon medical and nursing schools in Canada to require all students to take a course dealing with Aboriginal health issues, including the history and legacy of residential schools, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, treaties and Aboriginal rights, and indig Indigenous teachings and practices. This will require skills-based training in intercultural competency, conflict resolution, human rights, and anti-racism. And um, following that, can we get a motion to vary the agenda for Director Race? So moved. moved by Hillian. Second. Seconded by Grieve, thank you. And so, oh, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. So we'll go to F4 first. Okay. So F4 is Black Creek Oyster Bay Service Committee minutes from May 8th. Moved, Moved by Grieve, seconded by Grant. Is there any discussion on those minutes? Okay. And it's a vote of full board on receipt. All in favor? Any opposed? And those are carried. And there's a recommendation. Second. Moved by Hillian, seconded by Grant. And that's that the board approved the extension of the current fire and rescue services mutual aid agreement with the city of Campbell River, city of Courtney, town of Comox, village of Cumberland, and Ships Point Improvement District for a five year term. Any further discussion? And that's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. And we're moving on to F8. Oh, sorry, did I miss a rec Yes, sorry. Right. Two more recommendations. <laughs> Recommendation two moved by Grieve, seconded by Grant. And that's the, the findings determined in the fire service review report prepared by Tim and Ply Associates be implemented. This is a vote of C and D only. All in favor? And that's unanimous, thank you. Vote three. Uh, recommendation three, moved by Grieve, seconded by Grant, and that the board consider providing delegated authority to Black Creek Oyster Bay Service Committee for matters related to the operations and administration of the service. And this again is only a vote of area C and D. All in favor? And that's unanimous, thank you. Now moving on to F8. And that's the Black Creek Oyster Bay Service Committee minutes from May 15th. Thank you, any discussion of those minutes? And this is a vote of area C and D. Uh, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Um, where's 13? Report regarding the request from the Secretary of Service Committee in Black Creek Voice Bay for delegated authority of certain powers, duties, and functions. Oh, didn't we just do that in the last? Oh, okay. Oh, yes, I see now. Thank you, Director Grieve. Moved by Grieve. Was there a seconder? Director Hillian, thank you. And did you want to speak to this staff? Sure. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, so this staff report is a follow up to the resolution that the committee that the board just endorsed from the Black Creek Oyster Bay Services Committee. Uh, Jake Martins is available to uh, to briefly introduce this report and um, and the recommendation it contains. Jake, on the spot, a little bit earlier than we than we thought, but ready nonetheless. Thank you. Thank you, James, and uh, through the chair. Yes, so this, this report uh, 
is being brought forward following the consideration of delegated authority to the Electoral Area Services Committee and the Black Creek uh, uh, Oyster Bay Services Committee. Uh, the EASC had requested some more information and uh, uh, options on that, and so staff had come forward earlier this year with those details. The board is likely quite familiar with uh, providing delegated authority given its longstanding use with the Sewage Commission, the Water Committee, uh, the Recreation Commission, and then most recently with the Regional Parks and Trails Committee, so it's certainly uh, fairly widely used within the organization at current. Uh, the local government enables uh, broad decision making to be delegated to committees and commissions and other bodies established by the board. It does restrict certain things such as bylaw making, um, the power to uh, hire and fire staff, those types of decisions and other, and other matters that uh, again it restricts. Delegation is most typical for the administration uh, and operation of services. The act does not define that term, but generally you can, you can uh, uh, assume that that's most of the day-to-day -day business and decisions that gets uh, conducted with regards to our services. There are 75 services, which we've outlined in the report, that are administered by the EASC and two that are administered by the Black Creek Oyster Bay Services Committee. So um, the report is uh, recommending uh, the delegation of those services and, and again, with respect to the administration operation of those services to those committees. Tonight's uh, agenda is a great example of, uh, I think, some of the efficiencies that we can gain with uh, delegations. There's a, a number of recommendations on this agenda from these two bodies. Uh, the vast majority of those will go away. They will not have to be ratified at this table. However, there are some, uh, like I said, that concern bylaws that will continue to have to uh, come forward and be ratified. And some of those are quite contentious, particularly the planning development related matters are items where we're granting a development variance permit or a rezoning, which we've had uh, strong turnout from the community that may feel strongly about those matters. Those will continue to come forward to the board because the act doesn't provide sort of unilateral delegation ability around those matters. Uh, lastly, I'll just note that uh, the board does provide some, uh, or the, the act provides some uh, consideration for reconsideration of decisions that have been delegated. Those are legislative or statutory reconsiderations. So if someone disagrees with the decision of the EASC or the BCOB, uh, that does not mean they can come to the board to seek reconsideration. Uh, but if a statute provides a right to someone to have that decision reconsidered, then uh, the bylaw again would come into play and we've provided some uh, proposed uh, um, provisions for that. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, please answer any questions uh, in that regard. Thanks so much, Jake. Are there any questions? All right, yeah, I think this really came forward because uh, the Electoral Areas Committee is like their own council, um, like Cumberland Council or Courtney Council, but, uh, but oftentimes those decisions uh, come to the board um, to be certified, uh, which of course uh, the Courtney and Cumberland and Comox council decisions don't do so. So in, uh, in an effort of uh, fairness, we, uh, we'd like to uh, move forward this, this delegation authority. We're doing it for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't see any hands or further comments. Um, we are on receipt, I think, of the initial report. Uh, and I'll call the question on the receipt. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Recommendation. Second. Recommendation moved by Grieve, seconded by Grant, is that the board consider first, second, and third reading of bylaw 749, the committee delegation bylaw 2023, as provided in the staff report May 16th. Any further discussion? Okay, it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? And that's carried unanimously. Move by law three. Thank you. Um, Seven, four, nine, uh, four, first and second reading. Okay. Second. Moved by Greaves, seconded by Hillian. That's bylaw 749, the community delegation bylaw. And it's a vote full board for first and second reading. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Second. Third, moved by Greaves, seconded by Grant. Vote the full board, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And Director Rice, you are um, free to go, but you are welcome to stay. <laughs> okay, so back to the regular agenda. 
We are on uh, item C, adoption of minutes from May 9th. Moved by Grant, seconded by Hillian. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And minutes from May 12th. Moved by Grant, seconded by Hillian. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And we are on business arising from minutes, the delegation follow-up from the United Riders of Cumberland. So, Madam Chair, the um, as the agenda shows and as is our practice, we will regularly um, provide a follow-up action or, or an update to a delegation from a previous meeting, and that is the case here. The, the board had its delegation from the United Riders of Cumberland on May 9th, and um, the recommendation moving forward, if the board's interested, is that the funding request from the United Riders of Cumberland, as outlined through its May 9th delegation, be referred to the Commonwealth Valley Recreation Commission for consideration under the Recreation Grant Service. Thank you. So it was moved by Grant. Is there a seconder? Kerr, thank you. Are there any questions? Director Grief, go ahead. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Madam Chair. When they say um, the, uh, the Rec Commission, they actually mean Function 600 in this case, do they not? Yes, and I believe the Function 600 is the Recreation Grant Service, and okay. that is um, that is managed through the Recreation Commission. That managed through, so just to make, make it clear, it's not the, what, 660 six, or whatever it is? Yeah, 600, yep. So it's, it's a function 600. Thank you very much. Okay. Any further discussion? Um, so we're just on receipt. So all in favor of receipt? Any opposed? That's carried. And there's a recommendation? I'll move the recommendation. Sure. Moved by Greve, seconded by Hillian. Any further discussion? To vote the full board, all in favor? Any opposed? You're opposed? Okay. Director Grant opposed. That's carried. Thank you. On to petitions and delegations. And thank you so much for waiting. Um, today we have the Comox Valley Child Care Planning Committee, the Comox Valley Early Years Collaborative, Jesse Gill, Michelle Carty, Vanessa Simmons. Simmons? Simmons? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, if you want to come up to the mics over here. Second. Moved by Hillian, seconded by Greaves. Thank you. And you have uh, 10 minutes to present and uh, questions if you like following. <laughs> okay, so just press the bottom of the mic and yeah, there we go. Hey, can you hear me? Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Jesse Gill. I'm the coordinator of the Comox Valley Early Years Collaborative, and I'm here with fellow members of the Child Care Planning Committee. Um, I am a mom of two children in the early years, a Courtney resident and a qualified early childhood educator. Hi, my name is Michelle Carty. I am a early childhood educator as well, and I've been in the Valley for about 22 years doing child care, frontline child care, up until about eight years ago. And I am Vanessa Simmons. I'm an early childhood educator, a mother of a two and a half year old in, live in Cumberland, and I'm also a NIC instructor in the early childhood care and education department. Okay. So you may or may not be familiar with the Comox Valley Early Years Collaborative. Um, we are a group of individuals who share a vision to support early years children and families. That's defined as conception to age eight um, to thrive in the Comox Valley. We do this by building relationships amongst our network, sharing learning, strong communication and through work on these three primary joint initiatives. Today, we're gonna to be speaking to the work of the Child Care Planning Committee. Today, we're hoping to get through all of this in 10 minutes, um, but we'll, we'll lay out our request to you right away, um, then discuss a few key points and how we can create a sustainable collaborative childcare system. 
Michelle will give you an update on the current childcare landscape in the Valley. Um, Vanessa will speak briefly to the role of childcare in poverty reduction, as well as economic development. We'll highlight a few promising practices happening even here in the Valley, as well as on the island. And finally, lay out a few potential actions for the CVRD, the new social planner position relating to childcare. So these are our two recommendations. Essentially, we would like to link the scope of the new social planner position to our existing child care planning committee, first off, and also um, to ensure that this work follows the recommendations from the three reports you see there. Okay, so what we are all learning about addressing social challenges is the importance of collective work. We know this is necessary uh, to, cr to create positive change in the long run. Addressing the local childcare crisis is really no exception. Um, when we work in the Early Years Collaborative, all of our work is focused on systems change which is defined as any group of things that interact towards a common goal. So this goal can be explicit or not intended, but we are in the situation we're in with childcare, which is in a crisis. Um, system change is also complemented by an understanding of uh, this model of child development you see up in the left corner. Um, it goes by many different names. Um, but from an Indigenous perspective, it can be known as the circle of connectedness or Indigenous connectedness framework. It basically centers everything we do with the child at the center as precious and sacred. And then it looks at the influences such as family, community, provincial, um, cultural, and so on, interacting together towards a common outcome. Oh. I have a few more things actually. <laughs> um, what we really want to get at here is the young children in the early years are the future citizens of the Comox Valley. And if we made early building positive early childhood experiences a priority across our community, we would see a thriving community in the future. And we're really prioritizing this long-term investment versus addressing symptoms. So this will produce the positive results we want in the long-term in the Comox Valley. Okay, I'll pass it over to Michelle. All right, it's my turn. So I'm just gonna just briefly talk about the, ch the childcare landscape right now as it is. Um, it's been nearly three years since our Comox Valley Action Plan and the Cumberland Action Plan were released. Um, we're gonna briefly update you on the current childcare landscape. So as you can see on this slide, um, these are the childcare current spaces right now. And by 2029, the childcare spaces that are needed. And I'm, I'm gonna let you look at that. I'm not gonna read it out. Um, currently, CB childcare spaces serve one third of the families who need it. And I'm not sure if any of you have young children right now, but I'm sure you understand that uh, it's a, a pretty big deal if you don't have childcare and if you're looking at a two to three year wait list. Um, so from 2020 to now, the number of spaces hasn't really changed dr drastically. Um, what's happening is daycares are opening, but at the same time, daycares are closing. So it kind of is pretty even. Um, although there's a BC, ch BC child care plan and recruitment retention strategy provincially, there hasn't been many gains in, the grow in growing the field of professionals, leading to severe staffing shortages. Um, we need to triple the spaces to meet the need in the Comox Valley. Also with knowledge of growing population of family and children, and there's a lot of people moving to the Comox Valley, which I'm sure you know and hear here about all the time. Um, the biggest need, of course, is the infant um, toddler age as well as school age child care. Um, this is just a couple things that some of the families have said that they struggle with, and these are just some of the, the things that we're looking at uh, when we look at the impact that uh, lack of childcare spaces has. Um, 
there's a ripple effect, of course, on child, of, on parent well-being, and they're juggling very, very many demands. Um, and this this slide shows that parents are resorting to try to do the best for their families. Um, if you look at the green one, it talks about how parents are finding childcare, what they do when they can find childcare, and the bottom one, 53% relied on family friends for care. That sounds great, but it lasts about three months because you just burn out your friends and family and they just can't do it anymore. So, <laughs> or grandma and grandpa, <laughs> uh, if you're lucky enough to have grandma and grandpa in, in, in town. Um, one of the things my, my job is every day is literally giving bad news. That's that's my day is telling people that I'm sorry that you phoned everybody on the list that I just gave you and you still can't find childcare. And they say, well, what am I supposed to do? I have to be at work next month. It's not a fun job <laughs> some days, that's for sure. Um, some of the other things that we are dealing with is the workforce affordability and accessibility. So recruitment and retention is something that our child care planning committee works on with the North Island um, North Island College and community members, but it's, that's not our focus today. Um, there is big strides in the affordability, but there are only six programs offering the $10 a day uh, childcare right now in the Valley, and they have massive wait lists. Uh, we have another 58 programs that are doing the childcare fee reduction, which brings that down to about 50% of your childcare costs. Again, that's not a lot when you think about how many childcare spaces we do have. Um, so, First perspective, I want to say, like, how would you feel telling a family that um, they, they're they waiting, they're on the, they're 300th on the wait list to get into kindergarten? It's kind of the same idea. The child care is just as important. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's a pretty big one. And then the child, this is what's happening right now. So right now, the type of full-time child care is 70% of spaces are group child care. And 30% of spaces are in-home childcare, family childcare that are doing it from their homes. Who operates each type of childcare? Well, you're looking at 100% of them are privately operated. Those are the family childcare providers. And then the zero to five-year-old spaces, uh, they're pretty close. They're 55 and 40. And I think I said 40. I can't see. I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> They're pretty, they're pretty even there, but the school age spaces, um, they're mostly privately operated as opposed to nonprofit. Um, let me see. So growth provincially of the new spaces funding is focused on nonprofit, public, and indigenous childcare spaces. So this creates an immense pressure on nonprofit organizations who are one, already expanding their own facilities and two, expected to operate the new spaces as third party providers for the school districts, uh, their new spaces that are coming online. Um, they're also trying to deal with day-to-day -day workflows, staff shortages and mentoring educators and practicums. So that's a real challenge. So that's my part, thank you. So I'm gonna to talk to the role of childcare in child poverty reduction. So the four game changers up on the slide there that we highlighted are from the CV Poverty Reduction and Assessment and Strategy Plan and are all interconnected and through multi-sectoral collaboration in childcare and the early year services, this could have a big impact on future poverty rates in our community. I also think it's important to note that actually 85% of brain development happens in the early years, so meaning before five years of age. So the quality of their early experiences plays a critical role in how children grow. So having access to affordable and quality childcare can relieve financial stress for families, but also to help to break the cycle of poverty that many families live in. Uh, providing a strong foundation for learning will benefit children for the rest of their educational careers and have long-term benefits for their future prospects, especially in terms of their health and well-being. And access to child care can also benefit families living in hidden poverty. So that means those people who earn above the poverty line but cannot afford things like adequate food, hydro bills, child care, and other basic necessities. And so the role, role of childcare in economic development, lack of childcare spaces affects the economic development of the entire region. 
uh, we want to attract support and of course sustain families because they help our communities grow. So childcare, um, we can think of it as actually an economic multiplier and Childcare BC states that for every $1 spent on the early years, almost $6 are returned to the economy. So that means parents can get back to work, healthy job creation in the ECE field sector, and an increase in positive health and education outcomes for children. But I also wanna stress this point from a women's rights perspective. So I have a quote here from a community agency staff member, and that's this is from the CV Childcare Action Plan. The lack of childcare keeps people without the opportunity to move forward. I see it as a women's rights issue, affordable and accessible childcare levels playing field for women to have access to what men already have access to. And then to follow up, in 2020, Stats Canada found that 80% of lone parent families are female-led, and that the most common obstacle to sustaining employment was actually finding affordable and quality childcare, leaving many to raise their children in poverty. I'm sorry if actually, um, yeah, that's that's OK. I'm happy we got through what we did um, and you saw our recommendations so you can move forward with that. Yeah, um, maybe if you put the recommendations back on the screen, that'd be good oh, too sure. for our discussion. We go, yeah. go forward. Oh, no, go back one. Oh, there we yeah. go. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much for the presentation. Mm -hmm. I'll open it up to questions. Uh, Director Arbor, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks for the presentation. I caught the majority of it. And um, yeah, when we came out, well, through COVID, especially, and coming out of COVID, we established a economic recovery task force. And to our collective surprise, I was the mayor, as the chair, and, and many uh, economic leaders in the region. And one of the key recommendations is to invest in childcare. So when you talk about the economic argument that was loud and clear at the time, um, and that's why we actually ended up freeing a little bit of resources. I know in, in my area, we put funding towards the, the Union Bay uh, childcare in the, in the hall and Denman Island. And one thing that's pretty nice that has changed um, the last couple of years as well is that now it's not just the Ministry of Education, it's the Ministry of Education and Childcare. And we had um, the new superintendent and uh, the operations manager of the school district here last week, and, and they talked about how they are building that into their mandate and how they're trying to integrate child care facilities across the school district, which is with their level of capacity and dollars, it's well beyond what the regional district could hope uh, to do. So my question is, in the event that uh, the regional district did not uh, proceed with a social plan, or what would be your third recommendation? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that's tricky. <laughs> um, sorry. We do have representation from Director Grieve, uh, Director Melanie McCollum. Um, so... I really do hope you proceed with the social planner <laughs> position. I know there's a few groups that it would really increase the impact. And I'll answer that question in a second. But I, I think I, what I want to highlight is that we, we don't want the social planner to replace the work that is being done in community. There has been a ton of grassroots work done. There's a really strong committee of experts in this area. And we would just like the social planner to complement that work and to build relationships with our key community stakeholders. But if we didn't proceed, I'd say um, ensuring that there's consistent attendance and representation from all the areas to the early years collaborative, the child care planning committee or advisory, and that um, we stop dragging our feet on actually implementing some of the recommendations in those plans. I think it can still be done. It will be easier with a person dedicated to that, but we could um, actually the next slide we had, I wasn't going to read through, but it's lays out kind of first few steps that could be taken like actions more specific. So yeah, that would be my answer. <laughs> 
good answer. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I think we have a question online from Alternate Director Wells. Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and, uh, and and thanks to uh, Director Arbor for kind of talking about the ERTF and, and some of its findings. Um, I, only one correction, uh, Councillor Melanie McCollum is, is a rep from the City of Courtney, although she is also a director from the Regional District, but, um, um, and, uh, and, and I, I was uh, also on that um, uh, collaborative and, and really, I, I was really excited by uh, some of the things that were being talked about, uh, which is why I, I made sure we still have somebody that, that uh, attends those meetings. So re really appreciate that. Um, I, I guess uh, my question is, especially looking at, at this uh, slide here, because uh, I, I think there's certainly a lot of people that are understanding the, uh, the need for childcare. Um, and when I look on here in terms of how we as local government can prioritize, and you know, we're looking for grants, we're looking for ways to partner with say the province. Um, but the last item there where it says ensure dedicated focus on local government grant opportunities, is that looking that local governments are providing the grants or are receiving the grants in partnership with an organization to help facilitate daycare? I'm just, yeah. just I guess it's a nuance. Thank you. Uh it's an easy question to answer. The province is in, and through agreements with the federal government has large amounts of funding available through the BC New Spaces funding. So um, who is eligible to apply is nonprofit organizations, public entities and indigenous governments or organizations. So there's actually funding waiting to grow spaces. It would be beneficial if we, we know the school district is doing their part in uh, obtaining new spaces funding. We know all of, I, I think nearly every single nonprofit childcare operator is expanding their spaces. They are also being looked to to operate all the new school district places. As Michelle said, that is a huge pressure on an industry that is already mentoring all the up and coming educators that is already dealing with staffing crisis. That's like asking the people doing the work to do all the growth as well. So we would love to see local government step up to the plate and play their role and we also know that we can support this work because we have a lot of experience and knowledge in this area. So does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I, um, you know, I, I know uh, social planner is one of the things that the city of Courtney is, is uh, very strongly looking uh, towards uh, as well. And uh, I, I can probably say there's, there's a lot of support for, um, this type of position. And, and I really appreciate your frankness on the crisis that's there, not just that the daycare spaces are needed, but also uh, the fact that everybody is is really uh, at capacity and this requires more capacity. So really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Director Green. Thank you. And thank you ladies for coming in. Uh, one thing these ladies taught me is that someone you depend on depends on childcare. So when you're talking about staffing crisis, duh, this is, and we talked about this a couple of years ago, this is very much an economic development issue because if you can't get to work, then, then everybody's gonna suffer all the way down the line. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm thinking um, we were talking about 6,000 new daycare spaces by, what was it? By 2029. Oh, 2029? It's, more, it's wow. three and a half thousand is what we needed in 2020 when they did the needs assessment. In 2021. So we're about at a thousand. We hover around a thousand. So we need three and a half thousand in the next few years. And that's, you know, we have only a limited number of capacity to 
count spaces constantly. It's very difficult to count childcare spaces. There's a lot of flux. Um, so that's, you know, possibly something that the social planner could work with Michelle at on keeping, you know, a fairly good understanding of our spaces as we go, because there's always spaces opening, always spaces closing. Yeah, so it, it is three and a half thousand spaces predicted to be needed. And that serves about six, I think it's 65% of families. We're not assuming every single family with young children needs childcare. There's like kind of a measure we typically use is we want to serve like 65 to 75% of the population because there are parents who would prefer to stay home and can. Yeah. Does that include after school? Yeah, that's across the ages. So infant, yeah. toddler, preschool age, and before and after school care. Okay. Those numbers. So, and um, as far as uh, say North Island College, they can crank out about what, 30 ECEs a year? Is it more than that? Not quite. <laughs> Not even that? A little bit less than that. Yeah, okay. And is there, is there still... And if they stay in the valley. Yeah, if they right? stay in the valley. And yeah. we don't want to crank them out. <laughs> um, it's We want to make sure the training and the people that we're having work with our most vulnerable citizens are really qualified, really educated. Yeah, there's already issues with not everybody needing the same level of qualification. So, yeah. And and then again, raises the issue that if I remember, I don't have the right book with me, it's about three books ago, I think, that um, they had um, the burnout factor, mm -hmm. that within three years, yeah. the, so many ECs find other employment because you don't get a coffee break, You they're hanging on your leg as you're walking around. Yeah. So if, you're, clear if, you're family, that if you're a family child care provider, it's just you. You you with seven up to seven children in your home, and you literally are working ten to twelve hour days with no breaks, no subs, no anything. So the burnout is real, and the burnout even in group care where you have other adults to interact with. You're looking at two to three years, and most of them are like, you know what, I'm going to get out of the field because it's just it's too much. It's a lot. And how many family care providers do we have in the Valley? It's like some I would say the majority of our providers are family child care providers in the Valley. Yeah, there's quite a few of them. And a lot of them are at the age of retirement. So we're going to see a lot more um, closing their doors soon. Um, and again, like you're looking at two to three year wait lists for infant toddler care. Um, we just don't have the capacity for it. I just want to add, <laughs> as you can tell, we're all very passionate about this. Um, oh, no, it's slipped my mind. Oh, yeah. So really at the core of the issue is how society values early childhood education. And that is the biggest shift that needs to happen. There are other countries and other parts of the world where early childhood educators are the most educated. They, they understand this. They understand that we need the best, most quality, sorry, words, mm -hmm. highest quality trained educators to be with our children. So I think having like local governments buy into that and really understand that is a big step. It's a modeling to the community that we all need to really understand that. Thanks so much for bringing this all to us. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's really important presentation today. Um, we have obviously highlighted the need for child, child care, both in, um, as was mentioned, the Economic Development Task Force um, and then our poverty reduction strategy. And I think that um, with the changes in the ministry and um, the things that have been going on with the increased childcare spaces, maybe we've all kind of been like, oh, okay, you know, this is being addressed. But um, seeing what you've presented today, um, it, it's still falling quite short is the, yeah. the message I'm getting. And um, and there are th still things that we can do as, as you proposed here on this slide uh, um, within local government 
realm uh, to to help address the problem. So that's really great. Thank you for bringing it to our attention. Today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're on receipt. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. And um, oh, sorry to the, the ladies. We'll, we'll be addressing it. Um, your request at the following meeting. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so we're on to reports, and we have the Growing Communities Fund Allocation Status Report. Moved by Grant, seconded by Hillian, and over to staff. Thank you, Madam Chair, and Kevin Duville is here to provide a brief update to the staff report, and then um, between a few of us, we can answer any questions you might have. Kevin. Thank you very much. Uh, through the chair to the directors, good afternoon. So yes, the report in front of you is just providing a bit of an update uh, as to the allocations now being proposed with respect to the Growing Communities Funds. Uh, it also does provide some additional context that uh, we did present to the Electoral Area Services Committee uh, last Monday on the 15th of May, just with respect to the funding and how that was kind of rolled out on behalf of the province and kind of some, some suggested pass forwards. So as you'll recall, um, the uh, Growing Communities Fund allocations for the Comox Valley Regional District was uh, $4,497,000. That money was provided to us through the province of BC based on a, on a formula-based model or an allocations framework, as you will. And we've outlined that, that framework in the staff report for the board's information. I mean, in essence, there was, you know, kind of four primary components for that. Uh, there was a, a flat amount provided in the amount of 500,000. There was also a per capita amount for the total regional district population which equated to about $1.3 million. There was also an allocation specific for uh, the rural areas based on rural population, which totaled about 777000 And then the last amount was rural population growth between the fair, uh, two most recent census periods of 2016 to 2021. And that uh, resulted in about a $1.95 million allocation totaling that number. So if you look at it in that context, um, approximately 28% of the funding being provided is based on that total regional district population. And therefore, you could argue that that money could, you know, be kind of looked at or utilized towards a broader or suitable regional program or service. Uh, that $500,000 flat amount, while there are no parameters specifically attached to that, um, a third of that a portion of that amount could also argue, be argued to uh, be directed to those more regional programs, and that would uh, equate to about $160,000. So as a result, approximately 68% of the total growing communities funds uh, currently in hand, you know, would be, you know, kind of available for those rural or electoral area type purposes with the balance 32% being, um, you know, kind of reserved for those more broader based projects. So over the last five weeks, um, we've been working with both the electoral area service committee and the board to kind of put forward some, some suggestions with respect to how those dollars could be allocated. So coming up later in the agenda, there are two sets of recommendations uh, coming forth from the Electoral Area Service Committee as to some initial allocations of those funds, uh, totaling uh, $2.6 million and $235,000 respectively. What staff are recommending then at this point is that the remaining funds that would be left available, approximately $1.6 million, uh, you know, the discussions on how those funds could be allocated uh, would be best situated once the board has held and undertaken its uh, June strategic planning process to give all the directors kind of a bit of time and reflection as to how those funds, you know, could then, those remaining funds rather could be allocated. Uh, just keeping in mind that uh, we do have to fully allocate those dollars prior to the end of this year, being December 31st, 2023. And then we also do have five years with the, within to fully expend those dollars, and that's from the date of receipt. So that would be approximately March of 2028, where we would have to have those dollars fully allocated. So just wanted to bring forward a brief uh, kind of update on where we're at in the process, but certainly uh, happy to answer any questions. Great, thanks for that report, Kevin. And I think we have a question from Director Grave. Thanks, more of a comment actually, just for the, the board's information. Um, we did grapple with this and we, we deferred it, was it three times? <laughs> Forward, but um, as, as you know, um, 
we still have about uh, 32%, a little more than 32%, I think, that we have to allocate to regional projects. It was discussed that uh, the money should go to where the need is, not necessarily uh, territorial, and uh, more than, you know, more along the lines of essential uh, local government services like fire, uh, water, things like that. So it, it wasn't it was it wasn't an easy job, but I think we pulled together. And uh, even though it uh, we ended up with about uh, only about five percent going to area B initiatives, uh, about thirteen percent to area C, and about forty seven percent I think to area A. But area A was had the most going on with the Demon uh, Hall and the Hornby Hall and. Uh, and whatnot. So you'll see that even later on, we talk about uh, talk about the um, community works funds as well. So I think it it, it did show that we have a, a really good team in the electoral area, and that we're all helping each other out as best we can um, with these funds because it was a bit of a surprise. I don't think anybody expected this to be coming around the pike. Um, that being said, uh, I, I'm I'm looking forward to. Uh, to uh, maybe uh, coming up with some projects in the uh, in the next next year, so that actually you're area C centric. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Director Kerr. Yes, I was just going to say that uh, I appreciate the report, and I agree with you know waiting for that decision until after the strategic plan. And uh, Director Greve, you stole my thunder. I was just going to congratulate the three area directors for really taking a regional approach on this and I think that uh, makes for good decision making. Thanks. Okay, so we are on receipt. It's a vote of full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And there's a recommendation. Second. Moved by Grant, seconded by Grieve, and the recommendation is that the board defer any subsequent decision on allocating the remaining 1.6 million of growing communities funds until after the board's June 2023 strategic planning session. Any further discussion? Director Hardy? Yeah, through the chair to, to staff, and, and I probably already know the answer, but I'm gonna ask it anyways. Um, in regards to the delegation that we just had come in and talk about uh, child care and, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. I am wondering about the 1.6 that we still have remaining in the growing community funds, if there's a means of directing some of those funds towards it, uh, that particular initiative or that project or program that we just heard a, a presentation on. Thanks. Through the chair to Director Hardy. Um, my recollection is, I mean, child care or, or some program thereof wouldn't be specifically excluded uh, from growing communities fund, but certainly we we could, you know, uh, if the board direct us, we could certainly take a look at that and, and certainly bring back some more information as to just confirming that eligibility. Yeah, and I think that'd be good to also part of the discussion in June. Sorry, more so on the uh, the eligibility of projects like that. We typically the CVRD needs to own that that project or that um, that service in order to be able to provide funding to it through this particular um, grant. So there are limitations on the Correct. on the award of those funds to projects of the CVRD or services that the CVRD owns. So I think that would be a limitation with respect to what the the previous delegation was talking about. Right, and so. Um... That would also relate to any of the poverty reduction strategy outcomes in relation to child care that we wouldn't be able to put forward or put money toward those outcomes. I'd have to look at what the outcomes are specifically from the poverty reduction strategy. Um, if it is about partnering with third parties and those programs being del delivered by those other parties, then that would be a limitation. Right. Okay. If those game changes and outcomes are around CVRD services, then there's a possibility, but I'd have to look at what those game changes and outcomes might be. Yeah, I can, I can certainly supplement that as well. So yeah, I mean, it does specifically state within the criteria that we're not able to provide those dollars to, to third parties. Um, so for example, if we were to be considering, say, uh, something with respect to affordable housing or something in kind of that, that homelessness support realm, um, 
either the regional district would have to own any assets that were being funded under this program, or certainly at the very least, one of our member municipalities would have to own that assets and it would have to be driven through as, as the uh, acting CAO mentioned, it would have to be driven through a, a specific regional district service that, that currently exists. Thank you. And Director Arbor. Yeah, thanks. Kevin kind of said what I was about to say because we did discuss housing um, and I had rural areas as a potential. We said, what if at the end of the board strategy in June, you know, there was consensus. I remember Dr. Kerr encouraged us to put 40 million towards housing collectively. But um, and staff was like, well, we're not sure if we have a service or assets. But that's where we said what well, we could, because in 2011, the RD did buy some land toward affordable housing. And I guess the new information today, which I did not realize, is did you just say that the money could be passed on to municipal partners? Uh, through the chair to Burke Rubber, correct? So, so, if, so if, if the municipality were to be looking to own, you know, some kind of, of facility, uh, as long as that was being done through a regional district service, that that is something that could be considered. Yeah. So in relation to the chair comment, then I think it could um, relate to our game changers, but it would have to be pretty specific. And, and it's great to know that if municipal partners have ideas as well, you know, I, uh, anyways, in the end, I fully support the recommendation to uh, defer to uh, after the strategic session. And Director Hardy. Thanks, Chair. I guess the, the the one comment I got or question that I do have in regards to the strategic planning session in June is whether or not uh, we've really discussed affordable child care uh, with regards to strategic planning. And if it, this is an item that maybe should come up uh, during our session in June. Thanks. Uh, staff, or do you want to speak to? Um, the strategic planning session um generally speaking yeah, yeah. sure um so two days are set aside in june june 15th and 16th i believe the staff report is actually says 16th and 17th but it's the thursday friday june 15th and 16th and the um we're still formulating that agenda and we'll be working with the chair and vice chair to to finalize that but the intent really is to look at the, the core services that we currently have, the drivers that the board defines to help deliver upon those services, and, um, and then to look at the key initiatives under each of those services. So regional sustainability is one of our core services, and, and that um, incorporates the regional growth strategy as a service. So there is some, some um, room there when, when poverty reduction strategy is looked at and, and the child care, affordable child care um, is a component of the Atlanta, is is a component of the poverty reduction strategy. So there's room there under the regional sustainability as a core service to talk about um, affordable childcare. I think the the biggest sort of um, focus of that strategic planning session, and this is what we heard from the board in January, is that housing and and affordable housing is the kind of the key piece for the board to really grapple with, and so. The, uh, the format for those two days is looking to put a fair, a fair bit of time to the affordable housing question and provide um, opportunity there for the board to, uh, to have some good dialogue around what can regional districts do and what can this regional district do in particular um, on, on affordable housing as a topic. Um, that's not to say under the regional sustainability topic, the board could talk about affordable childcare as well. Um, but at this stage, the, the focus really is around that affordable housing piece. Thanks for that. Okay, I don't see any further lights or hands. So we are on the recommendation. Is that correct? Is, we've been first and seconded for the recommendation for it to be deferred to the strategic planning session. Until after Yes, the strategic planning session. Um, is there any further comments? Okay, it's above the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? And that's carried unanimously. We're on to item two under reports. It's Comox Valley Transit Management Advisory Committee minutes from April 11th. 
moved by Hillian, seconded by Grant. Are there any discussion on those minutes? Hearing none, below the full board, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And we're on to public hearing of bylaw 740 and 741 from May 4th. Moved by Grant, seconded by Grieve. Mm -hmm. And is there any further discussion on the Rural Comox Valley Zoning Bylaw public hearing? So we'll the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. And we've already done item four. So we'll skip ahead to item five, the Electoral Area Service Committee minutes from May 8th. Moved. Moved by Director Grieve, seconded by Grant. Any discussion of those minutes? To vote the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? Recommendation That's one. carried unanimously. Recommendation one moved by Grieve, seconded by Grant. And it's to endorse an agency referral. Any further discussion? And it's a vote of the areas. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Recommendation two. Second. Moved by Grant, seconded by Grieve. And this is regarding a grant exemption, bylaw number 600, the floodplain management bylaw. Any further discussion? It's a vote of the areas. All in favor? And that's carried unanimously. Recommendation three. Second. Moved by Grant, seconded by Grieve. And this is to give first, second reading to bylaw number 589, the Rural Comox Valley Official Community Plan Bylaw. Any further discussion? What are the areas all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Moving on to recommendation four. Moved by Grant, second by Hillian. And this is that the findings determined in the fire services review report be implemented. Vote of the areas, all in favor? That's carried unanimously. Recommendation five. Moved by, moved by Grant, seconded by Grieve, that the board approve the extension of the current fire service rescue mutual aid agreement. And this is a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Recommendation six. Second. Moved by Grant, seconded by Hillian, that the updates to the Comox Valley Regional District Fire Services Operational Guidelines be approved. Again, this is the vote of the areas. All in favor? That's unanimous. On to recommendation seven. Seven. Moved by Grieve, seconded by Grant. And that's the 2023-2027 uh, adopted financial plan for the Union Bay Fire Protection Local Services Area be amended. And it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. I'll move it. Moved on to recommendation eight, moved by Greaves, seconded by Grant. And that's in accordance with the standard local government practice, all work required on private property for the connection of the Union Bay sewer collection system be the responsibility of the property owner. And so we'll the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously on to recommendation nine, moved by Hillian, seconded by Grant, that staff engage in discussions with project partners and rights holders on the potential use of the portions of the ENN corridor for the South Extensions, Sewer Extension South Force Main alignment. Again, it's about the full board. Oh, Director Kerr, go ahead. Just a quick question on this. Um, for this, are there any parts of this land that are related to Comox First Nation territory or um, part of the potential treaty discussion? Over to staff. Uh, certainly the corridor is in the traditional unceded territory of the Comox First Nation. As far as treaty lands itself, I'm not sure that I'm able to, to provide much context on that. Um, I looked at my 
EMT if anybody else has any other information, but I'm not sure that I have um, specifics on that. There is proposed treaty settlement land in the south that, that extends for portions of the south, and I believe the Ian and Quarter does either bisect that or, or um, run along adjacent to it. I think Director Hardy would like to weigh in. Thanks, Chair, if I could. Uh, I think it's really important to read the sentence in the language that's being utilized there, and it, it makes mention of that staff will engage in discussions with uh, pr prospective partners. So I, I think when I first read it, uh, Jonathan, I kind of went, you know, I had some apprehension, then, and then I reread it again, and then I reread it again as I what staff is really doing is they're engaging with different governments and stakeholders with regards to the ICF. So I think that's the important thing to take, take away from that. Thanks for that. Okay, I don't see any further lights. We're on recommendation nine. It's above the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? And that's unanimous. On to recommendation 10. Okay. Moved by Grant, seconded by Hillian, and that's at the Royston pump station flood mitigation options two and three, as described in the staff report, um, uh, be included in the uh, sewer extension south liquid waste management plan addendum. And this is the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Recommendation 11. Moved by Grant, seconded by Kerr. This is regarding Comox Valley Emergency Program Extended Service Bylaw, and that it be amended to include City of Courtney, Town of Comox, Village of Cumberland as participants. Any further discussion? It's a vote of the areas. Oh, Director Gray, go ahead. What took you so long? <laughs> well, we're there now. <laughs> All right. What about the areas, all in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. On to recommendation 12. Uh, moved by Grant, seconded by Hillian, and that's the board endorsed the following actions regarding the Growing Communities Grant. Uh, Denman Island Fire Hall Replacement Project, 850000 Mount Washington Fire Hall Project, 600000 Union Bay Fire Hall Replacement Project, $1,195,000. Any further discussion? It's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Open to recommendation 13. Second. <laughs> Moved by Grant, seconded by Grieve. <laughs> and this is regarding uh, 40 hectares of land dedicated as park and Union Bay Estates development. Any further discussion? It's a vote of the areas. All in favor? That's voted on unanimously and round 14. Seconded. Moved by Grant, seconded by Grieve. This is regarding the trail that Moti uh, constructed in 2021 along Back and McDonald's roads. Any further discussion? And so the areas, all in favor? And that's unanimous, thank you. On to recommendation 15. Second. Moved by Grant, seconded by Grieve. This is regarding 29 hectares of land acquired by Park, um, being at the east half of the southwest of quarter section of, uh, let's see, Spike Road. Any further discussion? Director Grieve, go ahead. Thanks very much. Just for everybody's information, this is a long, long standing initiative. It goes back about 12 years or more to get the little connecting piece uh, through to uh, Sturgeon Road, I guess, you know, and and uh, end all road. So um, it's one of those situations where um, we could have got the land much, much cheaper, but as time went by, it got more expensive. I know we, we alluded to it this morning as well when we talked about um, about farmable areas and and the acting CEO mentioned that we had voted to keep this as kind of a uh, what, what was the term 
what kind of park was it like a, a conservation park because it does have a huge uh, or is is adjacent to a very large peat bog which of course as you know sequesters seven times more carbon than a forest but maybe uh, in in future we might revisit that because I'm sure some of that land could be used for uh, either incubator farming or, or or community gardens or something like that. So uh, that's not something to discuss at this point. But uh, just uh, just to look, give you a little background on the information that uh, it took a long time to get that little connection piece. And I also brought that up when we talked with the Ian and uh, railroad scenario that getting those pieces back is extremely difficult. Thank you. Thanks for that background. Okay, it is a vote of the areas. All in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. Move 16. Moved by Greaves, seconded by Grant. And uh, it's another land dedication, 0.45 hectares. Uh, Wilfred Road Conservation Area. Any further discussion? And it's a vote of the areas. All in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you. Seventeen. Second. Moved recommendations uh, seventeen, Grieve and Grant. And this is again a, a land dedication of 0 0.04 hectares in Schultz Road. Any further discussion? Let's vote the areas, all in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. And recommendation 18. Second. Moved by Grant, seconded by Hillian. And this is 0.15 hectares, um, also on Schultz Road. And let's vote the areas, all in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. All right, moving on to the Comox Valley Sewage Commission minutes from May 9th. Moved by Hillian, seconded by Grant. It's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. On to item seven. Moved by Hillian, seconded by Grant. That's water committee minutes from May 9th. It's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And there's a recommendation. Moved by Grant, seconded by Hillian. That the board amend the bylaw 129, the Comox Valley Water Conservation Bylaw, to revise the bylaw uh, attached as Appendix A, and to give first, second, and third reading. And it's a vote of the areas and Courtney and Comox. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Okay. Yep, we're skipping over eight. We've already done it. So Nine's been moved by Grieve, seconded by Grant. It's the minutes for May 15th. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. There's a recommendation. Second. Moved by Grant, seconded by Hillian, that the 2023 Rural Community Grants be awarded for the amounts to the organizations as outlined in the table attached. And it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. There's recommendation two. Moved by Grant, seconded by Kerr, that the board endorse the following allocations of the Growing Communities Grant um, as amended. And that includes Denman Island Cross Trail, Goose Fit Trail, and Seal Bay Nature Park. It's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. On to recommendation three. Second. Moved by Grant, seconded by Grieve, that the board endorse the allocations from the community works funds as listed below. Any further discussion? And it's a vote of, oh, Director Grieve, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, just a moment to note, and I think I brought this up at the electoral areas as well, um, that uh, again, in, in the interest of uh, sending the money where the need is most, um, and you'll see that the South Sewer South, South Extension is getting uh, $1,250,000. Um, and in that is, of course, is areas uh, B and C with the 511 
$1,653. So um, just uh, in the interest of, uh, of keeping it in mind, uh, again, with Area C, um, this will make uh, $1,511,653. Uh, dollars that that has gone to the South Sewer over the last seven years, in a way. So it, it's it's all it's all repayable. Uh, at one point in time, I'll be calling some of the favors back. Uh, there looks like there might be a, a project going ahead in uh, in the Northland there that would require a, a sanitary sewer as well. So one day I'll be calling the favors in. Thank you. Thanks for that background again. And it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And recommendation four. Moved by Grant, seconded by Hillian. That's at Union Bay Historical Society request of 22500 from the Rural Community Grants be funded through Area A and B Heritage Conservation Service. And it's the vote of just area A and B. All in favor? That's unanimous. And item 10 is the Comox request for support. Moved by, moved by Hillian, seconded by Grieve, and over to staff. Thank you, Madam Chair. So just a very brief staff report to introduce the correspondence that we received from the Comox First Nation. Um, Comox is hosting its annual National Indigenous Peoples Day on Wednesday, June 21st, and um, have noted a couple of um, requests or opportunities to, to seek some funding and partner. The CVRD has three heritage conservation services in uh, electoral areas A, B, and C, and um, there are some funds that are unallocated or uncommitted for 2023. So staff are recommending that uh, $20,000 be provided to Comox First Nation in response to its request, um, with the source of funds being the, uh, the areas A, B, and C Heritage Conservation Services. Thank you for that. And uh, we did have a discussion about it again today um, with staff that uh, we'll be having a meeting with KFN Council soon and we'll um, uh, offer some more support um, other than funding as well. So we have, uh, oh, we're on receipt and it's a vote of the areas, all in favor? And that's unanimous in the recommendation. Moved by Grant, second by Hillian, thank you. And that's the CBRD approved donation to the Comox First Nation in the amount of $20,000 to support the National Indigenous Peoples Day celebration on June 21st. Any further discussion? And so the areas, all in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. And moving on to 11, that's the Climate Action Strategy Budget Amendment. Uh, moved by Hillian, seconded by Grieve, and over to staff. Thank you, and I'm pleased to introduce Alana Malali, General Manager of Community and Planning Development Services, and, uh, sorry, Planning and Development Services, and uh, Alana will introduce the staff report. Thank you, James. Through Madam Chair to the Directors, um, in April, just a very short time ago, we brought forward a community scale greenhouse gas emissions inventory for your receipt. And we also obtained direction from you to scope a climate action framework. So this work will be undertaken within the Regional Growth Strategy Service, and it will include all of the service participants and will respond to existing RGS policy that encourages each jurisdiction to create a climate change adaptation plan. So just as a, a brief reminder, that framework will deliver uh, a best practice benchmarking analysis to identify actions that are underway by leading jurisdictions that are similarly positioned in respect to services and size and uh, community infrastructure and mandate, the CVRD. It will include analysis of gaps and opportunities within the context of the CVRD sphere of influence. It will identify pathways similar to what you see in the CVRD's corporate energy and emissions plan. It will identify pathways um, to provide a set of GHG mitigation actions, again, within our sphere of influence. And these pathways will be directed towards um, achieving the provincial GHG emissions targets. 
The work will also include engagement with the RGS service participants and with the public to provide input on the preparation of that climate action framework. Um, the framework notably will also inform the basis of an RGS action plan, which I'll get into a little bit further in the next report on your agenda, uh, but ultimately responding, as I say, to existing policy direction within the RGS. So engagement will begin in the fall, and then we'll bring something forward to you in the spring of 2024 with, with some interim um, opportunities for feedback too. So ultimately the recommendation is all about funding. We're suggesting uh, that there are two reasonable options for you to consider to fund the preparation of this work. Our recommendation is that you transfer $87,000 from the Regional Growth Strategy Services Future Expenditure Reserve to the operating budget under other professional fees. Just as a reminder that that future expenditure reserve um, includes carry forward dollars. So either work that we did so efficiently that we have monies left over or work that perhaps didn't get undertaken. So that's our first recommendation, transfer from future expenditure into the operating budget. Uh, we suggest that this is an equitable way for all of the service participants to fund the work and an efficient way to use those carry forward dollars. Alternatively, option two could be for you to consider transferring $25,000 from the electoral area local government climate action program funding, which is currently housed in the electoral area planning service um, to the RGS service to augment those existing carry forward dollars. This, of course, would mean that the electoral areas would be um, contributing to the work via their contribution to the RGS service plus a separate contribution from their uh, local government community action plan dollars. Sorry, action, local government community action program dollars. And I'm happy to respond to any questions you might have. I'll open it up to questions. And Director Arbor, go ahead. Thanks. And in regards to um, last part, um, you know, uh, with the local government climate action fund uh, allocation. So um, we have a resolution that is now heading to UBCM after passing it, EVICC, that we're going to ask the province to quintuple that amount of money. Um, and the rationale being that we would, and they also put it on a 10 year horizon uh, at the province. It's currently on a three years horizon. And that would allow local government to actually better plan and their capital uh, um, capital plans, I guess, um, uh, deeper and, uh, and um, more effective uh, greenhouse gas emission strategy. So, so I'm just trying to, as we advocate for that, I'm kind of hoping that we are actually reducing real GHG with the funds that are already provided. So uh, I'm just not sure if the allocation of those rural funds um, I'm always scared when we put everything into a planning exercise, uh, and this, and, and, and so I just want to clarify that this would be for planning purposes in regards to the local government, uh, action fund. Is that right? Through the chair to the directors. So, um, staff's recommendation for sure is to use dollars from the future expenditure and not to use the LG right. cap dollars, but to your point, yes, this is a planning exercise primarily, uh, that will help us to, to set those targets and identify the pathways to achieving the targets. Okay. Thank you. So I, so I support the staff recommendation and, and, um, uh, and I'm hopeful that all of our local governments are actually going to invest the, the other pots of fund into actual real reduction through our capital planning processes. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any further lights or hands. We're on receipt. It's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And there's a recommendation. Moved by Hillian. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> oh, I didn't even see who that was. That Director Cole Hamilton? Yeah, second. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Way to be on it. Thank you. Um, so the recommendation is that the 2023-2027 financial plan and capital expenditure program for the RGS service be amended by increasing other professional fees by $87,070. All right. It's for the full board. All in favor? 
Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. We're on to item 12, the regional growth strategy review initiation. Report. Moved by Greaves, seconded by Grant, and I'll pass it to Stan. Thank you. And uh, again, I'll introduce Lan Mullally, General Manager of Planning and Development Services, um, to introduce this report. Thanks. Thank you, James. Uh, through Madam Chair. So back in 2022, we were directed to undertake an RGS review scoping exercise, as you'll recall. So over a series of six meetings in the fall and early winter, um, the RGS Technical Advisory Committee, which you'll recall is made up of planning and engineering staff, came to consensus over a number of things related to the prospect of a five-year review. One, the RGS bylaw is working. Two, no significant policy gaps in respect to the strategic drivers and priorities that you've set. The land use designations uh, remain relevant and they're aligned with the provincial direction uh, around housing, infrastructure management, and development approvals. And four, that a focus on comprehensive bylaw amendments uh, would protract sorry, that if we were to do um, a comprehensive bylaw amendment with related standard amendment process, it would likely protract the implementation of key actions that are already contemplated in the RGS bylaw, such as a regional affordable housing strategy. So on this basis, um, the TAC made a recommendation to the RGS steering committee. You'll recall that the, the committee comprises your CAOs. Um, and, and the steering committee found that specific administrative and contextual updates uh, are most appropriate at this time to the RGS bylaw. So the process that I've, you know, at very high level described is consistent with the scoping steps that are outlined in the RGS bylaw, which, which includes sort of an order of operations and some marching orders for us anytime the board is considering undertaking an amendment to the RGS bylaw. I would like to highlight that some of the matters that came up during um, staff's presentation to you about possible scope uh, can be readily addressed as implementation items, so no changes required to the RGS bylaw. And some of the examples that we heard from you included uh, a need to identify ways to promote agriculture uh, as an economic engine, um, finding ways to accommodate the demand for affordable housing in our core settlement areas, um, and uh, undertaking some targeted community engagement on wicked problems. So our suggestion to you is that we can, we can do this work either through the RGS bylaw amendments that are being proposed and related implementation, or these are concerns that can be addressed through um, official community plan work, zoning bylaw work, or other work resulting from development approvals reviews that each of the local governments is undertaking present. So in terms of where we are today, the LGA, you might recall the Local Government Act, sorry, is clear that an amendment to the RGS, even an administrative and contextual update, uh, such as what we're providing as a recommendation to you today, can only be initiated by the board uh, by way of resolution. So today, staff is recommending that you initiate an amendment based on the scope that resulted from that collaborative staff scoping exercise your ensuing board discussions in February and, and March, and the approved RGS service budget. Lisa, the appendix to this report includes a chart. I wonder if it's, if it's easy, if you wouldn't mind putting it up on the screen. No. Right. So the Local Government Act provides for two processes for you to consider an amendment to the RGS, a standard amendment or a minor amendment. Sorry, that's appendix B, Lisa. The standard process is defined within the Local Government Act, and it is applicable to the preparation of an RGS bylaw, as well as amendments to an RGS bylaw that the board deems to be um, not minor. Standard amendments require the review and acceptance. Well, that just doesn't work out. Thank you for trying. We'll just, I'll, I'll talk it out. Um, standard amendments require review and acceptance by all local governments, affected local governments, and recall those are defined right in the Act. Um, and where acceptance is not obtained, the Local Government Act sets out a process for ministerial resolution, so either uh, settlement or arbitration. So it's fair to say that a standard amendment is a complex and resource-intensive process. 
in recognition that some flexibility is required in response to changing conditions within uh, the local government at the local government level. The Local Government Act enables regional districts to establish a minor amendment process, and that is on the left side of your chart here. A minor amendment cannot substantially change the vision or the direction of a regional growth strategy. Staff suggest to you that it is because our regional growth strategy is forward-looking, it is flexible, and it is responsive to the contemporary wicked problems that we are facing, that we are suggesting to you that a targeted amendment is appropriate at this time in order to update aspects of the bylaw that will serve to aid in its implementation. The CBRD's RGS bylaw contains the criteria for determining whether a proposed amendment is minor and sets out a process for the board to consider such amendments. So that is the process that's shown here on your left at high level. Staff suggests that the um, proposed amendment described in the recommendation to this report meets uh, one of the key criterion or the key criterion around minor amendments in the bylaw, and that is that these are text and map amendments, which are not directly related to enabling specific proposed developments, but can be considered minor if, in your opinion as the board, the amendment is not of regional significance. I would just note that a decision of the board to undertake a minor amendment process must be supported by a two-thirds, uh, two-thirds in the affirmative. Um, so in respect to your strategic drivers, it's, we, we talked a little bit about this in February, March, but staff suggests that this uh, amendment that's in front of you, the language contained in the recommendation, this is their verbatim language that the TAC considered, the steering committee considered, and that you saw back in February and March around content. We suggest to you that these align well with your strategic drivers. So in respect to fiscal responsibility, this is work that we can primarily undertake in-house. Um, and the report provides you with a high level budget to, um, to address the financial costs of the review. Uh, all of those dollars uh, are within the approved service budget. In respect to climate crisis, the proposed amendment includes an update to the plan's GHG projections, and that's sort of related to the, the item I was just speaking to you about. In respect to community partnerships, staff would suggest to you that the last piece of the recommended amendment regarding the addition of action plans to the implementation section, this will enable us to really dig in with our community partners and rights holders uh, around uh, in, um, uh, implementation of the existing policy within the bylaw. And then finally, in respect to Indigenous relations, the proposed uh, scope does include updates to parts of the RGS bylaw that reference Comot's First Nations treaty process. And we'll, I'll come back to this in a moment, but we'll prepare a separate consultation plan um, to understand how Comox may wish to be engaged in an RGS bylaw amendment process. So at this point, um, we're suggesting that you have at least three options available to you. One would be based on the scope described in this report and included in the recommendation. You could initiate an RGS amendment and direct staff to undertake a minor amendment process to consider the proposed changes. Secondly, you could define an alternative scope for an RGS bylaw review and direct us to come back with budget, content, and process considerations for your review. Or certainly, you could opt not to, to initiate an amendment to the RGS bylaw at this time. So based on all of the work that's been done to date through the scoping, through the budget discussions, uh, we recommend to you option one, a targeted amendment focusing on the items in this recommendation using the minor amendment process. So if you do opt for that, for option one, we'll report back to you with two consultation plans for your consideration. Um, one will be specifically focused on consultation with Comox First Nation. And the second would be geared to more general consultation with the affected local governments, school districts, and the general public, as well as key provincial and federal ministries and their agencies. We will also provide notice of initiation of the amendment to the province and then work with the province, uh, provincial staff, pardon me, um, to obtain direction and understanding how they may or may not wish to be engaged in the process. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Alana. And you're open to questions. Uh, we have Director Arbor first. Yeah, thanks for the report. And I'm in support of the staff recommendation on this one. Um, 
think overall the RGS is working pretty well. The only thing I have in mind, and maybe staff can provide feedback on that, um, is maybe a resolution for next year that I'm thinking about for um, the province, which is, it's still, you know, don't do unto others what you don't want done unto you. Is that how it goes? Anyway, there's some English expression. But um, uh, one of the things that uh, lobbied with some of the mayors last year was uh, around provincial electoral boundaries and such. And we've had a real big surprise with Qualcomm now being with Lady Smith and uh, things that don't make a lot of sense to our communities. And one of the things in the RGS that still doesn't sit fully well with me is the provincial process for um, municipal expansions uh, or going into the ex settlement expansion area. I've talked about the rich many times at this board, how that happened over the course of this particular RGS, where um, an area was taken over without taking existing homes and with the promise of bringing services and then it was changed. So only the development area, uh, the green field was taken over. So that happened under our existing RGS. And I'm kind of concerned that this could happen again because the municipalities have a direct relationship with the province. I would like to, and I don't know if staff can feedback on that, but I'd like to consider asking the province to amend the uh, municipal expansion process so that it requires um, the, uh, the assent of the rural areas. Uh, and potentially of the First Nations. I don't I haven't thought so much about that one. But I think um, there's always a risk in British Columbia that we will continue to, municipalities will continue to be hungry for land. And it seems like the process is still a little too easy um, to expand. So um, yeah, something I'd like to bring up. I don't know if, if staff thinks that there's any merit to bring that inside the minor amendment. I believe staff may say no, but I thought I'd ask the questions anyway, since it's today we're deciding. Uh, through Madam Chair to the directors, uh, a couple of thoughts there. One, I think that that is uh, uh, a matter that has been an electoral area issue in particular for a long time. It's something that we heard a lot about during the uh, OCP review work in 2012 to 2014. And at that point, we um, recommended that the directors, and they did, include language around uh, our hoped for or desired process when uh, a municipality is considering um, incorporating additional lands or rural lands. So that's in our official community plan. I think it's an important piece that if this board is interested in, in having that conversation with the province, I think that's legitimate, particularly um, in respect to some of the crises that are facing us as a province and, and where folks might be looking to uh, for land to address that um, those needs. Uh, in respect to the lands that were incorporated, just it was it was over Christmas time, you might remember, and so we were we were all a little bit surprised when it happened because there really wasn't uh, consultation in the way certainly that we'd hoped. Um, those lines were included in the settlement expansion areas. And so I think that was probably the basis upon which the regional, the, the electoral area directors at the time thought, you know, it didn't seem to be an infringement on the RGS boundaries themselves. However, it certainly did feel like an affront to many of the residents in those areas. So I think it's a, it's a point that's, that's certainly worth keeping on the table. I don't think it's a point that needs to be addressed specifically in a minor, minor amendment, but certainly OCP language maybe needs another look. Yeah, thanks for that tip. And I guess it'd be the OCP of, of all concerns in, in a sense, because if we just have it in the rural areas, it's, uh, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't really do the point. But I think the higher point is what I take away from this is my assumption is correct that currently municipalities can just move ahead um, and cherry pick the areas that, uh, that they expand into within the RGS framework. Uh, and that any change in those processes would probably be under the, the pro provinces um, guidance because currently they do allow that right okay thank you very much i just add one piece my, my experience with boundary extensions is that yes there's a there is a very there is a process um through the legislation through either the community charter or the local government hat um and so the ministry the province does look for that consultation and outreach it's not um it's not so simple as to to identify lands and take them into municipality there is a process that is followed um i'm just not sure how regimented it is all the time and how how um how extensive it's followed all the time, but certainly the, the province does look for the um for the process to be to be looked at. 
yeah, thanks to CEO. And I, I wasn't going to talk again, but now I, I, I'll just reiterate what Alan has said. I think what happened back in those days around that land was, you know, within a matter of days, I know my predecessor, it was part of my training, uh, Bruce Jolliffe, when he was area director, he, and he was chair of the regional district. And the boundary expansion happened, as Alan has said, over Christmas without notice. So if there's a consultation process, clearly there are ways for people to avoid it. Thanks. Next, we have Director Grant. Yeah, thanks. On, on boundary extensions, we actually don't get to just go cherry pick and take whatever we want. It's not really the way it works. As a matter of fact, we have a boundary extension that we've been looking forward to just to get our boundaries a little more contiguous for 14 years. And it's still sitting down there and nobody's looking at it. So it's not like we just go take them as we want them. Also in our community, <clears throat> we're bursting at the seams. And if we're, it's, we've got uh, right now over 2,000, over 2,000 strata units on our books going through our system right now and more coming. And we have no land. And so we are getting inundated with giant buildings in our community based on the RGS, and it's difficulty for us to get more land in order to accommodate. If, if we want to play a role in the housing crisis, then we're going to need more land to do it. So I'd be cautious about making amendments and making it harder on the communities to do that. We don't do it just because we want more land. It's a dead loss to us for the most part. And so, you know, we, we do it usually out of health issues where people want water or sewer in order to fix a health issue. In, in some of these cases that we have right now, um, we're just right at the edge of, edge of the road. And our public is not happy with the amount of building that's going on based on the RGS theory of 90% of in your community. So we're really struggling with that issue right now. And I would caution you to be really careful if you're gonna start amending that. Next we have Director Grief. Thanks. Um, yeah, as you probably know, I have my issues with the RGS as well. And I was there when the bombs were falling, but um, one thing I would caution is that nothing remains the same. The development is what happens while you're busy making other plans. Uh, we have a, a possible development up, uh, as I was alluding to earlier, uh, in the northern part of Area C. And uh, people are, are demanding um, municipal light services. You know, um, you know, they've got water, they want sewer. Um, all the things that municipalities are designed to supply. And it's it's kind of difficult to meet the objective of uh, the development and not be a municipality. I'm sure Daniel's feeling the same way sometimes at Union Bay. So, I mean, historical perspective here, perspective, I, I grew up in the Comox Valley when uh, Courtney and Comox were three miles apart. And now you can throw a rock from one to the other. So, you know, Stuff happens, right? And uh, you just have to roll with it. Um, I've got my, um, like I say, I've got m some people in, in the area that are basically living on uh, urban style lots just beyond the city boundaries. And I think that's why why the, uh, the there was the Ida Chong letter way back when and stuff, because then those days the municipalities were accusing the rural areas of cherry picking. <laughs> which I guess we kind of do because they use your recreation services as Director Grant always alludes to. But, you know, it's a give and take scenario. And I would also suggest that uh, that uh, municipal expansion has kind of got a, a self-limiting factor to it in that it costs an awful lot to supply those services out there. So it's, it's not a slam dunk. Even when you get developers paying the majority of the costs, it's still a... a it's it's a lot of pressure uh, on on municipalities. Uh, obviously, the uh, the change is um, hard to take for the the so-called uh, rural areas that aren't really rural. I guess they're semi-rural, semi-urban, whatever you want to call them. But I guess what we have in the regional growth strategy is a bit of a fudge, and uh, there's not not everybody's going to be happy with it. So uh, as far as cracking it wide open and going to uh, RGS, what was it, 
Director Kerr said 1.5 or something that doesn't exist. So we have to live with what we got. The best thing we can do is to is to keep reviewing it. Uh, what we made a mistake in earlier on was we started for funds to the point with reasonable strategy had no money in the function. And so we never could do any review at, at that point in time. So there may be something uh, come along that may demand a, a major amendment, but um, uh, I don't see it yet. So I'm probably going to be supporting it. And uh, and we'll see what happens in, what, 2027? Is that the next one? Okay, so we'll hang on till 2027 to see what gives. Thanks. Um, I should be uh, the mayor. Of I Trump. actually had a question about um, the wording uh, at the last bullet point uh, when it says add reference uh, in part five. Uh, to the development of the action plans. Uh, I just wanted to be clear that I think the um, the, the action plans are a, a very key part of the review. And um, I just was wondering if it should just read um, development of action plans as opposed to add reference or if, if that's clear enough. Well, it's three, Madam Chair, to the director. So Maybe I'm using bylaw language here prematurely, but um, the, the thought here is that in our section five, we've got um, something called a, a subheading called undertake additional studies and projects. So I think the thought here was so that we would add uh, the term action plans that would implement each of the goals to that section. I'm not sure if, if perhaps I'm not So it's the inclusion it. of the term, um, but the direction to actually carry out the action plans is coming in another um, motion or at another meeting? Uh, through the chair to the director. So I think, um, you know, previously we talked to you about how uh, at the staff level, we felt that the policy basis for undertaking action plans exists within the current RGS. So for example, within each of the goals, you remember there are eight goals that are thematically based. Within each of those goals, the policies or objectives include reference to some way to implement. So for example, under goal one, housing, uh, there's reference to considering preparation of a regional affordable housing strategy. So I think the direction is there. I think by you considering whether or not you will add that specific reference to the tool, I think that would be sufficient to authorize us, us to embark on the tool. When it comes to the preparation of each theme-based or goal-based action plan, most certainly that would come back to the board to consider, you know, similar to what we're talking about for the climate action framework in the previous report, would you enable us to do the scoping, assign a budget to us, engage uh, in a public consultation, and then come back to you for direction. Great. Thanks for that clarification. Okay. I don't see any further hands or lights. We're on receipt. And the uh, receipt is of the full boards. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. The recommendation moved by Hillian, second by Grant. And it does require a two thirds vote. It's a vote of full boards. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thanks, Lana. We've already done 13, so we're on to bylaws and resolutions for first and second reading, starting with bylaw 589, the Rural Comox Valley Official Community Plan Bylaw, Amendment 4. Moved by Grant, seconded by Hillian. It's a vote of the areas for first and second. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Number two is bylaw 657, the Rural Comox Valley Zoning Bylaw Amendment Number 7. Second. Moved by Grant, seconded by Grieve. It's for first and second reading. It's a vote of the areas. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, we've already done bylaw three, so we're on to bylaw four, which is the 765 Comox Valley Water Conservation Bylaw Amendment 9. For, moved by Hillian, seconded by Grieve for first and second reading. And it's a vote of the areas, Courtney and Comox. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Third, moved by Hillian, seconded by Grant. All in favor? 
Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And we're on to item five, bylaw 766, the Comox Valley Emergency Program Extended Service. Move first and second. Second. Moved by Grieve, seconded by Grant for first and second. It's a vote in full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Second. Third moved by Hillian, seconded by Grant. Vote the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. We're on to item six, which is bylaw 767, electoral area parks regulation bylaw amendment nine. Second. Moved by Grant, seconded by Arbor. Kerr. Kerr. Uh, for first and second reading, and it's a vote of the areas. All in favor? That's unanimous. Move third. third moved by Greaves, seconded by Grant. Vote of the areas. All in favor? That's unanimous. And Rhonda bylaws following public hearing for third reading only. Bylaw 740, the Rural Comox Valley Zoning Bylaw Amendment number 11. Third. Second. Moved by Grant, seconded by Grieve for third. Let's blow the areas. All in favor? It's unanimous. Item eight is bylaw 741, the Royal Comox Valley Zoning Bylaw Amendment 12. Move 741. Moved by Grieve, seconded by Grant. And let's blow the areas. All in favor? That's unanimous. And bylaws for adoption, bylaw 737, Comox Valley Regional District Financial Plan Amendment 1. Moved by Hillian, seconded by Grant. It's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. That takes us to new business. Under new business, we have new business notice, the public hearing for bylaw number 589 and bylaw 657. Moved by Grant, seconded by Hillian. Is this something that staff want to speak to or is it just on there for receiver? Just for um, for establishing the requirements for that public hearing, and when we get to the recommendation, we'll look for a uh, uh, a chair and first vice chair and second vice chair for the public hearing. So, thank you. So we're on receipt. It's above the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. And there's a recommendation, and you will have to appoint a, a chair and vice chairs. I appoint Director Arbor as chair. He hasn't done it yet this year. Okay, he declined. So, anyone else want to want to try? <laughs> okay, and those vice chair. Okay. So the motion is put forward by Grant. Is there a seconder? Second. Seconded by Helian, and. Uh, that the public hearing, the chair be Director Hardy and vice chair, first vice chair be a Director Grieve, second vice chair, Director Arbor. Director Grieve is chair. There's no date yet. Oh, sorry. Um, so the there's a correction on that. The chair be Director Grieve and first vice be Hardy and second vice be Arbor. <laughs> okay. It's about the full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Oh my God. We're at the end. How much money? Anyone to move termination? Oh. Oh, no. Grant and Hillian, all in favor? All right. Thanks so much to those online. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.